Do you remember where you were when Operation Flashpoint and, ultimately, Bohemia Interactive entered your life and fundamentally changed your gaming expectations? I do. It was Christmas 2002. My Uncle Kelly, who always kept up on the latest PC technology, was telling me about a game that sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before. A game with real day and night cycles, where one bullet could kill you, where you could shoot, drive, and fly anything in the game world which also happened to be multiple square miles in size. Where he was telling me about he and about 15 of his buddies were on the same side fighting against hundreds of AI. It was absolutely massive and I struggled to wrap my 13 year old mind around this game that sounded so incredibly monstrous. There was no way my computer could handle it, but I was wrong. About a month later, I got my hands on Operation Flashpoint. At that time, the extent of my PC gaming library was Half-Life, Medal of Honor, Age of Empires, and Diablo 1 and 2. In those days, Half-Life was the largest first-person shooter gaming world I had yet encountered. And it's always when you encounter the pinnacle of your own experiences do you tell yourself that this is it. There's no getting bigger than this. Oh, what a journey my young teen mind was in store for. Immediately upon launching, I encountered something I'd never seen before. A game that showed actual engine-generated visuals in the menu? That was cool. The game's plot sees you revolving between multiple protagonists throughout the campaign, showcasing different aspects of Operation Flashpoint's combined arms combat operations. Set in 1985, during the height of the Cold War, you begin as Corporal Armstrong, a squad rifleman with no outstanding abilities, but is able to speak his mind rather coherently as opposed to some of the other junior soldiers in his squad. As you progress, you bounce to other members of the US Remnant forces, including a tank commander, a helicopter pilot turned A-10 pilot, and James Gostowski, a local retired Special Forces member who is called back into service to run nighttime raids and ambushes on Russian troops and bases. This bounce between characters allows the game to showcase multiple aspects of combat instead of just one single path. My favorite thing about this game is that, unless otherwise stated, you are completely up to your own devices on accomplishing missions. You could start with four tanks and a platoon of infantry and be given an objective to destroy a target or hold your position. As I begin my journey into the campaign, I'd often get stuck in situations where I only had myself to blame. I had no foresight into the actions I was taking, but I started to notice things, and I started to learn. I would notice that my equipment, ammunition, and weapons would carry over from mission to mission. The more ammo and weapons I could scrounge, the more I would be better prepared to face the enemy in the next mission. Keeping my teammates alive and moving as a unit while following my team lead's orders were paramount. Operation Flashpoint gave me the tools to begin thinking outside of the box in video games, and my survival depended on my ability to learn and adapt. I was hooked. Eventually, I stumbled across something that was hiding in plain sight, but had little meaning for me at first. The editor. This tool would soon become the biggest time suck I had ever experienced in gaming up to that point in my life. I could create the most insane little scenarios, walls of 50 caliber machine guns against 100 invading enemies, 20 on 20 tank battles, insane air battles that would cause my shitty Pentium 2 CPU to want to launch itself into space. Little by little, discovering more of what this incredibly powerful tool had to offer. Eventually making zombie survival missions with an oversaturation of fog that I and a couple of my lifelong friends would play and freak ourselves out in in the middle of the night. I had never experienced anything in a game that matched this editor's level of creativity. The sheer scale of what you could do was still woefully misrepresented as back then online forums just weren't at the forefront of my mind so I largely stumbled around in the editor until I figured the most mundane things out like simply how to spawn a unit in the air as opposed to on the ground, or having a unit start inside a vehicle's cargo while in transit. I'm honestly embarrassed by how long it took me to figure out how to even switch seats in a vehicle once I figured out how to spawn them empty. Little by little, the options opened up, and hours upon hours of fun were had with basic scripts and waypoints. Then I found my second biggest time suck. Mods. There were a ton of mods for Operation Flashpoint. Many of the teams that began creating mods are still creating some of our favorite mods today, such as Red Hammer Studios. There was even a Battlestar Galactica Viper Mark II mod 
as well as a Star Wars mod that had TIE Fighters flying at Mach 6. Shit was wild, but making campaign missions for it was too much fun. This would be a creative foundation I would build off of for years to come. There were also two expansion packs that came with the additional campaigns that shipped with the Game of the Year edition, Resistance and Red Hammer. Resistance is my favorite of the two as it places you in the shoes of Victor Troska, a man that has seen his fair share of war. Even though he is done with war and politics, he reluctantly becomes leader of the Resistance when the Soviets invade the island of Nogaba. The feeling is grim, dark, and hopeless. You're facing an enemy that vastly outmatches and outnumbers you in both equipment, weapons, and manpower. Victor knows this and initially refuses to fight based on his involvement with two previous wars, but when the Soviets attack his home and kill his neighbors right in front of him, he is compelled to join the resistance and give the Soviet invaders what they deserve. This campaign is great because although you are hopelessly outgunned, the game mechanics and design allow you to outsmart the enemy through cunning and violence of action. They may have an armored convoy, but you have anti-tank troops lying in wait. You make them bleed, but at a horrible cost in civilian lives. I had mentioned in a previous video that Arma sends an anti-war message. Some of my viewers commented asking what the hell I was on about. Though Arma is indeed a realistic war simulator, it still sends an anti-war message. War is brutal, in your face, and oftentimes unescapable. The fact that civilians are often caught in the crossfire, or are indeed the target of brutal regimes to push an agenda, is an underlying message that Bohemia sent through the resistance campaign. The other campaign, Red Hammer, sees you in the boots of a Soviet soldier stationed on Kolgajev who was previously demoted from the Spetsnaz back into the regular army for insubordination. Later you find out that it was indeed his refusal to kill civilians that got him demoted, which comes up again when he is ordered a second time to kill civilians during the invasion of Evron. Without going into spoilers, the Soviet higher-ups constantly make terrible decisions and orders that force you to the brink. I never played Red Hammer as the disc was too scratched from my own negligence as a teen, but it sounds pretty awesome. Even to this day, Operation Flashpoint, now called Arma Cold War Assault as of 2011, is incredibly fun and even though it is heavily outdated, its charm and nostalgia value alone are worth the buy when it's on sale. Fast forward to 2006, I'm a senior in high school and I have a vastly underpowered PC. Then Arma drops. My mind is blown. These graphics were insane, but it's called Arma and not Operation Flashpoint? What happened? Well, Bohemia Interactive and its previous publisher, Codemasters, were in a bit of a behind-the-scenes war. Eventually, the two would split when Bohemia caught wind of Codemasters wanting to create the follow-up game to the Operation Flashpoint without them. Bohemia kept the assets and technology used to make the game, but could no longer launch any software under the Operation Flashpoint IP that unfortunately belonged to Codemasters. Thus, Armed Assault was born. Now, admittedly, I wasn't a huge Arma fan at first. It was the same, but different. Yes, it was beautiful for its time, and the scale in which it rendered its world was second to none, at least to me, but it lacked a certain charm that Operation Flashpoint had. Honestly, it felt rushed, but I loved the direction Bohemia was going, so I pressed on, and the more I played it, the more I became enveloped in its new world as did hundreds of thousands of others, so it's safe to say that the game did well considering it was essentially Bohemia rebranding and reinventing themselves. They took a risk, and it paid off. Arma felt like a slightly more refined but less powerful version of Operation Flashpoint. It did well to grab the realistic feel and immersion, but its weapons felt underpowered for some reason. It was as if every weapon was gas-powered but had a leak somewhere. That's the best way I can describe it. Nothing fired with that oomph and power you'd want your weapons to have. Maybe others wouldn't be bothered by this, but I was playing a lot of Call of Duty United Defensive back in those days, and that game was in your face with the weapons effects, so my standards were a little skewed. Armor really went for that realistic feel, and my overexposure to the visceral and bombastic chaos of the early Call of Duty games drove my expectations. But I digress, Arma was fantastic for what it was, sporting the 98 square kilometer island of Sahrani, 
the world itself was much more fleshed out than the barren landscapes of Operation Flashpoint. It was clear with these graphical and world building assets that Bohemia was continuing to perfect its craft. Eventually, Armed Assault would see its expansion Queen's Gambit released in September 2007. I never actually picked this one up as I was gearing up for university at the time and trying to focus on my GPA. It did pique my interest though and I'd watch it from afar as a few of my friends who grabbed it told me how it was a good continuation to the main Arma storyline. Once I left for university, I had dropped Arma for a couple years, until my world was rocked in 2009 with the release of Arma 2. And it was gorgeous. Unfortunately, it ran like four day old dog shit on my now massively underpowered PC. I honestly can't even remember my system specs from those days as I was more focused on graphics cards rather than the CPU. It wasn't until Arma 2 Operation Arrowhead came out that I was able to afford a PC upgrade to run Arma 2, and once I did, oh man, I was back. The weapons felt beefier, the vehicles were thick, detailed, and powerful. The cockpits of aircraft were becoming a work of art and an absolute joy to look at and fly in first person. The modding community was having a field day, launching tons of mechanics reworks and porting in old assets from Arma 1 to extend the gameplay options. Again, I truly didn't think it was going to get bigger than this. Pakistan was like a second home. The amount of time I spent zooming around that map killing Taliban fighters is probably an embarrassing amount of hours. Arma 2 would see a few expansions released, bringing in British Armed Forces and the Army of the Czech Republic. Admittedly, because I was a broke college kid, I only ever bought Operation Arrowhead, as the literal Takistani sandbox was really all I needed at the time. And then, in 2011, I graduated university and immediately left to join the US Air Force. I again fell off the Arma wagon for a couple of years. After a while, I remember seeing a beta launch of a new Arma 3, and it looked wild. The graphics were near photorealistic. There was no way my machine would run this, but I tried anyway. During my tour in Korea in 2014, I finally upgraded again to a little above Arma 3's minimum specs, and from there, a love-hate relationship blossomed. I had played tons of FPS games before to include the other Armas, but never like this. Why was I getting my salad tossed by dudes a kilometer away? The graphics were so impressive and the game world was brimming with so much detail that now camouflage and gear had a huge impact on combat capability. Bohemia has had lightning in a bottle since 2007 and continued to improve on this winning formula. It was around this time that I started paying attention to what was going on in the Arma community and that certain members were transitioning over to the next platform, such as Dyslexi, whose videos I relied on to teach me how to play this game. I was truly envious of his ability to get the shots and edit the way he did, and I knew one day I'd use this incredible platform to do something similar. Arma 3 and the Real Virtuality Engine 4 would become the single biggest gaming time suck I had ever experienced, and it's still true to this day. Bohemia struck gold again with the new Arma 3 launcher, which made it easier than ever to load mods through the Steam Workshop. Once I figured this out, the amount of accumulated playtime hours would begin to rack up. Mods. Oh, the mods. There are so many mods. More being added daily, and there's no end in sight. Bohemia's open communication and understanding that the modding community is one of its best assets has kept the player-developer relationship flourishing for eight years now. The DLCs that drop continue to add more depth and gameplay options that whole sub-communities are centered around. Apex in 2016, with its host of numerous platform updates, laid the framework for the future of Arma 3. The numerous DLCs like tanks, jets, and helicopters add a ton of phenomenally crafted assets and abilities. Some that have become staples of the franchise and can be seen on almost every server. The recent creator DLCs Iron Curtain, Prairie Fire, and Western Sahara are further proof of the collaboration of Bohemia and its community. After all these thousands of hours put into this wonderful game world with amazing people, there's just one question. What's next? 
there's tons of speculation that the next Arma would be built using the Infusion engine. Indeed, this new game engine does look incredible, and the possibilities look endless. With the hilariously lackluster launches of the recent Call of Duty and Battlefield generations, I continue to wait patiently with the hopes that Arma 4 is on the horizon. I 169% believe that Bohemia can capture lightning in a bottle a fourth time. And the announcement alone would be the next biggest thing in gaming and would absolutely shatter the internet in a tidal wave of hype. Well guys, thank you so very much for joining me on this retrospective journey through my time in Arma. Truly, I have grown up with this game in one form or another, with every iteration being centered around a huge milestone in my life. Honestly, the only time I'd be able to put Arma 3 down is with the introduction of Arma 4. So here's hoping I don't log another thousand hours of Arma 3 before then. But even if I did, that's a thousand hours well spent. I'd like to thank my amazing patrons for their dedication to me and my channel. If you're interested in becoming a patron, please see below in this video's description, as well as a link to my Discord channel. Thank you all again, truly, for sticking with me on my YouTube journey. It has been a great ride these first couple of years. Here's to many, many more. And I will see you in the next video. Oh, this is gonna be sexy. I'm off. <laughs> I'm, I'm off. off. <laughs> burners on. I turn it off, burners on. And I'm putting my gear up. Hi. <laughs> I'll play her too. Fuck yeah. God, these flares are so beautiful. Fucking like... badass.